You're watching In Technology, a video cast where you can get smarter about cybersecurity, sustainability, and technology. Hi, I'm Camille Moorhart, host of In Technology podcast, and I want to give a brief intro to the conversation we're about to play because it's a little bit it's a little bit different than some of our other ones. I am very happy to let you know I have Kelsey Morera on. And she is CEO and founder of a company called Dope that makes legit cookie dough. So you're correct. This has nothing to do with technology, her company. But I got to know her when she was working at Intel and we were putting out a product together. She's very well-versed in technology and has a, a strong background there. She's also phenomenal at business and has been recognized for that by Forbes making the 30 under 30 list. And she's also been in Shark Tank a couple of times. She was so good at business that I don't think I was the only one who was surprised when she quit her job at Intel and started her own company based on her passion of baking. But her company, Dope, does more than just produce uh, the cookie dough. It's also heavily invested in every way you can think of um, in supporting people who are going through addiction recovery. I'm very happy to have Kelsey on. She herself is in recovery, and so she tells a, a, a very candid story and provides very candid advice to companies about how they can embrace and support all of their employees. She is also just really fun and humorous and has a ton of energy. I don't know where it all comes from. And on top of all of that, She's pregnant, and so you'll hear us reference her unborn baby daughter, Olivia. Um, please enjoy the episode. Thank you. Thanks for having me. It's great to see and you Olivia. again. Yes. <laughs> and Olivia. Yes, don't forget, she's on stage. She's just slightly out of view, but she's there. Is it her, is it her first podcast? <laughs> it's her first podcast today. This is a big deal. <laughs> you did it. It's awesome. All right. Kelsey, for anybody who doesn't know, is a, is a serious star. She quit her job in tech, which was very sad to me, but probably a good thing for, for the world because she went and started this amazing company. But tell us a little bit about your journey to get there. It's funny because it really all starts with Intel back in the day, you know, getting this chance to go work at Intel. I was just 16 years old when I started. I was a high school intern working, you know, part-time through the school years and full-time every summer. Uh, it was an amazing opportunity that turned into a 10-year career at Intel from just such a young age. So what was an awesome opportunity to learn from amazing leaders, much like yourself, getting to work in your group there towards the end of my, my time at Intel um, it was also really hard on my mental health and I was struggling from a pretty early age with seeing my achievements and like what I was doing in the world as my self-worth and a way that I could get some attention. My parents are going through a divorce when I was six years old and I feel like I saw the joy I could bring to them when I was doing good and th those connections got really strong. And so when I would get even a B on a test in school, I was in hysterics, you know, I just could barely take it. So fast forward to any performance review that where there was even the most minute sense of feedback and I was distraught, like I had failed, you know? Um, so I was really, really hard on myself. And for me, when I first found alcohol, I was uh, 14 years old, the first time I drank and I drank till I blacked out the very first time. And I had this like for the first time ever sense, like I was everybody else. Like I didn't have to be on and I was just carefree and relaxed and the life of the party Kelsey that could just, yeah, pretend like I was like everybody else and didn't have all this weight on me. So it started a pretty unhealthy drinking career over the years. I was able to mask it with this amazing career, you know, growing at Intel, great grades. I, you know, I was something like 21 credits my first semester in college, got straight A's and I was, you know, blacking out probably like five nights a week and still working at Intel part time. Um, so I was really able to, to mask it and still have this kind of like party life Kelsey that was going on in my personal life, but be all on at work all the time. And so no one really knew, you know, the struggles I was going through behind the scenes. But in 2015, I made the amazing decision to finally get sober. I was on a business trip with Intel in, uh, in Barcelona and uh, just had the last hurrah, if you will, the last night and woke up that morning. Like, I never want to feel like this again. I'm so tired of apologizing for things I barely remember doing. And, um, I want to make a change. So I got sober and that opened up like the whole world to me, like got me to 
figure out who I am and what I love to do. And that is eat and make desserts in large part. So that's really where it all, all started and, and formed into, you know, where I am today with Oat. So who was the first person you called? Yeah, I called my Nana first. So she was 21 years sober when she passed away. And, you know, like many people who struggle with addiction um, or even just mental health struggles, and you've got people who, you know, are worried about you and are reaching out through the years, like with concern. She was probably the leader, cheerleader for that group for me, you know, writing me letters over the years, like wanting me to get on the right path. So I called her that morning and said, you know, a short version of what had happened and that I was done and I wanted to get sober. And she was like, well, you better get your wee butt to a AA meeting <laughs> in her Scottish accent that I won't try and mimic right now. Um, but very kindly just said, yeah, that she wanted me to find a meeting and like, I'm here for you. I'm going to support you. And, um, and I did, I found an English speaking AA meeting that morning in Barcelona, made it through that seven day conference in my first seven days of sobriety, uh, which is crazy. And yeah, and flew home after that to literally feeling like my life was ending. You know, I had lost a relationship of four years at the time, uh, had blown up, you know, with that night and, um, everything just felt like it was falling apart, but, you know, brick by brick, you just pick yourself up and get going and, and take the next step forward. So my favorite question, uh, from my daughter was like, when did you know you'd made it? Oh, that's so sweet. You know, <laughs> I think the answer is honestly, you'll never feel like you made it is what I'm learning. <laughs> it's like making it is the journey. Like making it is realizing that everything I've learned to date is making it is like worth it. But there's no finite point where I've been like, this is it, you know? Cause when you have this personality where you want to keep building, you want to keep growing, you know, I had no idea when I first started that it would be as big as it is now. Like I remember calling my dad when we hit a hundred thousand dollars in sales and I was like, Oh my God, we've sold a hundred thousand dollars of cookie dough. And now we're past 13 million in lifetime sales. I mean, you just, the scale just gets so much bigger, but when you're in those moments, it's just where you are. And like the next hurdle, the next obstacle, the next point to hit is just, you know, that's all I'm looking. That's all I've been really looking at as I keep growing it. So I've never been like, this is it. We made it, you know, Shark Tank was pretty cool, but I didn't feel like, you know, all right, I made it, you know, rest on my laurels. Like it's hard work. Running a food business is no joke. And, um, the obstacles and the learning and the challenges just keep presenting themselves. So yeah, still going. I'll let her know if I end up feeling like I've made it one day. <laughs> Did you ever have a moment where you were like having to decide on sort of your morals or your conscience or your ethics or your, you know, code or whatever it is, as opposed to some other kind of bigger step or offer or. Mm. Yeah. I mean, I've had some, uh, some less than enjoyable experiences fundraising, you know, where you have to be like, this is inappropriate. And you know, this is not someone I want to take funding from and be okay with walking away from you know, what would have been an amazing, like life-changing access to capital and, you know, know that your morals and standards are more important than that. So um, there's been a little bit of that. I'd say, you know, in the business world, one thing we've really had to stick with is like the decision for us with Dope for Hope and how important the mission was going to be for the company. It's really easy for businesses to say, things have gotten too hard. Like, you know, we haven't been profitable for the last three years. Like we've got to cut costs. Like we need to cut the mission. And for me, it's just been like, absolutely not like no chance. Are we letting that go? Uh, not even willing to entertain changing it. Like the amount that we donate 1% of all of our sales, you know, we've had talks of like, should we go to a percent of profits and those things come up? Other people kind of bring it up when we're getting advised on our financial situation. And it's like, nope, like we can talk about cutting anything else, but like, I'm just not cutting what we're doing with the mission. It's like, it's the whole, why I can keep going through how hard and challenging this is. Like it keeps me going. It's um, yeah. You really have to have like a North star for why you're doing what you're doing. And I know we're helping so many people and I just, there was no way that I'm going to sacrifice on that. So. Mm -hmm. So tell us a little bit more about dope for hope. Yeah. So 2017 I uh, was, you know, newly into business, maybe six months in and we were getting our first 
I can't really call this one a storefront because it was a kiosk, but it was like a physical space and we would no longer have to pack for events out of my apartment. So I was very excited. It was going to be a real like 10 by 10 space that was, you know, for dope, a little cookie dough bar on Market Street in San Francisco. Um, and the grand opening day was my two year sobriety anniversary, like on the exact day. So on the Facebook event, I said, if you say it's dope to be sober at checkout, you'll get 20% off in honor of the founder's sober birthday. And I didn't expect to see much from this, but our DMs were just like filling up with people saying, you know, some that they were two weeks sober and wondering if I knew of any good meetings in the city. And another person was 13 years sober and telling me how he had never told anyone. And it was really cool to see me sharing this publicly. And I just had such a light bulb moment then of like how alone I felt when I was going through it, how I, and it took me a long time to say I'm ready to get sober because I didn't want to be different. I felt like I was going to be the only one that had to deal with this. And why couldn't I just be like everybody else? And when you're newly sober, you know, and everyone else seems like they're drinking and everyone else seems like they have it together. uh, This really reminded me that like, I'm totally not alone. Like there's a bunch of people out there who also feel like they're the only ones going through it, but we're all here. We're just quiet. And we've, you know, through a number of reasons in the past, the stigma that surrounded it has made people want to stay quiet around it, that something was wrong with you. Um, if you needed to get sober or you were, you know, a liability or a bad person. And, you know, people would ask me like when I was early on, if you're going to fundraise, are you going to tell investors that you're sober? You know, aren't you worried about what they'll think? And I'm like, I can't wait to tell them I'm sober. Like it's the coolest thing about me. It's like, Hey, I saw something wasn't working in my life and I changed it and look at all the great that's come from that. I mean, that's, that's kick ass. That's something you should be really proud to share. And So Dope for Hope was really, how can I help break the stigma around mental health and addiction recovery and let people know it's okay to not be okay and really make an impact around it. So we do a bunch for our community, like elevating the conversation, trying to make it uh, easier to talk about, share real stories of real people going through it, helpful resources and all of that. Um, We do like a mental health Monday text blast, for example. We just had another one this Monday that says, give us one high and one low from your last week. A real person's waiting to respond and you know, this is text to, we got something like 40,000 people on our text list. And we have hundreds and hundreds of messages and conversations that start from that with people who just didn't have anybody to ask them how they're doing, you know, and haven't really been able to stop and share what's, what's been really hard on their minds. But um, yeah, someone tweeted, like, it's really cool to see dope, you know, cares about this, like mental health can be so exhausting. And it's funny to see a cookie dough place doing it. And I'm always like, you know, if not us, then who? Like, it doesn't matter what we sell, we can try and make an impact. So the community is a big portion of it. And then inside the company is the next pillar for it. You know, really focused on not just being a business that's out there like, oh, we plant a tree for every blank, you know, or we do these things in outside world. I wanted to make sure that like, it was also happening in the company. I wasn't just talking about how important mental health was, but I was letting my employees talk about theirs. And So I made a really robust mental health policy early 2018 that rolled out and I have a template of it on my website. I share with other employers and founders just to get ideas going about how you could bring these conversations to light in the workplace. Um, Dope is a designated recovery friendly workplace, which is a designation in something like 25 states now. They have a program here to help people understand how to build environments, let their employees bring their full selves to work across mental health, addiction and suicide prevention as well. Um, and then the last piece is donations. And honestly, I think Intel a lot when I talk about this, that my time working for Intel showed me in many facets how a company can be totally for profit, but gosh, look at all the good that they can do along the way. I was the benefit of one of those Intel IESC trips, you know, got to go to the Philippines and we were bringing technology to a school that had been devastated by a typhoon. And um, that was just such an incredible thing. Like, mind you, that was About a week after that Barcelona trip when I got sober, I'm not sure if you remember this, Camille, but it was a crazy whirlwind for me of like home for a week. And then that, that volunteer trip was coming, but I didn't know you were going through the other side of it. I I knew about the trips, but I never knew that the giant transformation that was happening in your life at that time. Yeah. All overlapped, but kind of beautiful in a way that this trip was like, take yourself out from all these things that, oh, it feels like the end of the world. And then you're seeing kids who are like, just like almost in tears, excited, seeing themselves on a webcam for the first time, you know, on a little tablet or something. So uh, we decided to donate 1% of all of our sales company-wide to nonprofits that work in the space. Uh, The last two years, we've been partnered with the She Recovers Foundation. They're for women or those who identify with women's communities that are in or seeking recovery and across lots of things. They have this phrase that like, we're all in recovery from something. 
So life challenges, mental health, substance use disorder, uh, whatever your thing is, they've got a community for it. And um, we've donated more than $100,000 to date through Dope for Hope. So that's very cool. Um, so just on a personal note, do you, is sobriety something that's like a daily struggle for you or is it not a struggle? Is it, how would you characterize it? You know, in the phase that I'm in in my life now, I live in a very small town in East Texas. I'm like three minutes away from my grandpa. It's basically a retirement community. I'd say my median friend age is like 75. <laughs> so my daily pressures to drink, like I used to face when I was, you know, living in Portland when I originally got sober or living, uh, you know, in San Francisco for a time, mid twenties, uh, newly sober. Those were, those were different. And it certainly was like really everyday reminders that I go a different path. And, um, I wouldn't say it, there's a day that it doesn't come up. You know, you go out to dinner, you go, uh, to a friend's house or anything and they're having beers and I just don't I have a mocktail or some fun, you know, non-alcoholic drink. So it's always on my mind. Uh, and the scariest thing is like when you think you've beat it, you know, you meet people, I, I've met people who have, you know, 30 years of sobriety. And then one day they're just like, you know, I think it's been long enough. I think it's fine. And go back to it. And, you know, as many stories go, like it's, it wasn't fine. You, you know, you still are the alcoholic inside. And, um, I've just been able to bet, like get much better with mental health coping mechanisms and, you know, I call it like my mental health recipe card. What are the things I need to be doing to keep myself feeling good and, and feeling grounded? And yeah, it's just been that next first drink will never be worth it. I just can't, can't get there. Whew, what amazing, amazing, amazing story. Like really. Um, okay. Who, uh, who did you first bake with? Gosh, first bake with probably my mom. Um, my mom is a, she's a really great cook, but also love to bake. And she had, this is poignant for dope because one of the things she would do with me uh, after the divorce, like when I'd be going back to her house, she had this cookbook called like uh, the great cookie cookbook. And it was like a hundred cookie recipes. And so she'd be like, you can pick any recipe in here and we'll make it together, you know, this next week or whatever. So, uh, lots of baking with her, but then, um, tons of baking with my Nana over the years, you know, when I was first, when I was young and then after getting sober, like I have some really great memories. She passed when I was one year sober. So just after, um, just after I'd hit a year. So she got to see, Monster Baby Bakery when I was doing the baked goods, uh, bringing stuff into the office at Intel and enough folks like you saying, hey, you know, could you make something for my kid's birthday? I had a business pre-dope, you know, to do this at-home bakery. So she got to see that, which was really awesome. Mm -hmm. And so whose recipe is Ride or Die? That's your original recipe, right? Yeah, the classic. Um, so uh, Ride or Die and that base recipe for that is what I've used for every flavor I've made since, you know, being able to adjust for what I want to create. Um, it really was like an on accident creation. So when I was moved down to San Francisco, it was maybe six to eight months sober or so. Um, I got a new job inside of Intel to go down to the Santa Clara office. And like many people who transplant to the Bay area, I tried being a vegan. <laughs> I thought like you needed to do that to get, you know, initiated into the city. So, um, in my attempt to be a vegan, which I totally failed at, if you just ate some dope, you know, there's butter in it. I did find a really great substitute for raw eggs. And so I was using this flaxseed substitute, but starting to bake with butter again. And so my cookie recipe that I'd been making, you know, probably for the last year or so since, since getting sober at that time, uh, I kind of stuck with this one chocolate chip cookie recipe. It was now safe to eat raw and able to be baked. So I was like saving a bowl of it to snack on through the week in my fridge and baking a few cookies when I wanted it. And yeah, that's when the light bulb went off. And amazingly, we have not changed the recipe in all these years. Um, the only thing was like reducing the salt a little bit when you scale up a recipe to these large sizes, you often have to make quite a few changes. But the only thing we did was reduce the salt a little from my homemade version of it. And that's it. It's the same ride or die for all these years, which is awesome. Do you still bake? I do. Cakes and everything. I'm like the resident birthday cake maker around here. So when someone's having a birthday or we're having a party, like I love to love to make the layer cake still. Um, I haven't gone as detailed as those Panda cupcakes I made way back for, for your um, child's birthday back in the day. But yeah, I still bake, I bake cookies. So I, it's funny because you start a company because you love to do something. And then very quickly you're running a company, not baking cookies anymore. Um, 
I won't say very quickly. I was still <laughs> sweating it out in the commercial kitchen for probably the first like year and a half or so. And then we moved to co-packers and it's just, you know, scaled up from there um, with the production. So uh, yeah, not doing it in my kitchen, but I try to make a point of keeping it as a, you know, personal hobby and still a big part of my, you know, who I am and what I love to do that I got to discover in sobriety. Um, this little community that I live in with all these older people, I'll just tell you this one quick. Um, these old ladies think it's so funny when they start, you started hearing about dope and you know, it's big news. Like, wow, the shark tank thing is like, they're here and hide away. And they're like, so you're making all that cookie dough in your <laughs> kitchen. Like they think I'm producing yeah. all of the cookie dough <laughs> here in, in hideaway, Texas. I'm like, no, no, not anymore. Just, I could make you some, but no, we're not doing it all here. So they can't understand how, how you could run a company from, <laughs> from not where you're producing it. <laughs> so where, um, where do you make it? Yeah, it's all produced and fulfilled out of Las Vegas. So when we uh, transitioned from having storefronts, so I had San Francisco's Pier 39, and then we opened up on the Las Vegas Strip. Um, the Shark Tank episode in 2019 came out just after opening that store on the Strip. You know, fast forward a year later, the pandemic hits and our e-commerce business was like skyrocketing. We went from like 30 boxes a month in November of 19 to 3,000 a week in April of 2020. So our whole business model just like flipped on its head. You know, our storefronts were shuttered with the quarantine. Um, we decided to shut down the San Francisco store and by October of 2020, shut down the Vegas store. So what I you know spent most of the the second half of 2020 doing was getting our supply chain established with is my husband had joined the company at that time and you know getting everything set up to have manufacturing and fulfillment in Vegas there with us and slowly but surely as like you know wheels started turning and things were moving we were just like working from our home office every day going why are we still in Vegas <laughs> you know like we don't actually need to be here when we're using you know these great partners that we've we've gotten set up so we were able to move here to be close to my my papa in Texas and yeah let all the manufacturing and fulfillment live there is goes back to visit um the facilities probably like once a quarter now but you're still I mean like you pointed out before Olivia's been all over the place you're you're traveling what's like a day in the life or a week in the life for you what does it look like now you know, the best thing about it compared to Intel life, right, of like going from corporate to what I do now is I literally can't tell you a like week in the life of Kelsey because it's always different, like uh, depending on where I'm going or what I'm doing. I mean, the public speaking has been such a great um, component to pick up. Not only is it great for dope and you're, you know, getting more people to see the name, but getting to share my story and inspire people, you know, to make a change in their life, whatever it is. I feel so fulfilled. So that's been really fun to to pick up. So a sprinkling of public speaking events. Um, I'm going just to Dallas, not too far, but for a panel next week to speak. So there's a little bit of that that's been sprinkled in um, sampling events for different companies. So lots of the travel has been with Costco. They have us on a roadshow tour this summer, uh, you know, going out four days straight all the hours that Costco's open telling people why this is life-changing cookie dough and you need to buy it <laughs> and come and try it immediately. Um, so it's high energy, very fun. I had to skip out on these final two because I am just too pregnant to make it, make it happen. It was a lot, a lot for me, but yeah. Um, you know, we've split the business operation like management between is and I, I handle more of the sales and marketing. So day-to-day -day office stuff for me is, um, you know, managing the marketing team, being the closer, you know, getting on when we can get a, a call with, you know, a new potential client, um, whether it's in food service or in retail. Uh, it's that kind of magic spark of being the inspiration. I run the product development as well. So all the dreaming of like, what do we want to do next? What's the roadmap for us for new product innovation? Um, I make product briefs still <laughs> all this time later, like I used to at Intel. They're a little more fun. There's more exclamation points <laughs> and uh, a little more wild than what I, what I used to do. But um, yeah, it's still lots of product marketing. Just I went from processor chips to chocolate chips. So you have always struck me as a very confident person. You're, you've always been very competent. Um, but you, you kind of like have a way of shining, you have bring a lot of energy and light and, um, it, you know, is that just innate? Have you ever like not felt confident and then it's a show you put on, or is this just a natural, like how you move through life? I guess I would say it's like a self-fulfilling way of being like it, 
propels itself. So the more like excited and energetic you are, like the more um, pleasant interactions with other people are, you know, I, you're able to like exude something that helps other people feel more relaxed or comfortable or um, to laugh. Like I, <laughs> even when I meet someone who's quite grumpy or like, if they're on the customer <laughs> service line or something with someone who's really just not having the best day, it's like, I really love like trying to see how I can help them laugh or like have a you know, shake up from the monotony that like they've been going through. Um, so that's been a big part of it. I think, um, yeah, I, I have, I have been kind of like this personality of like bright, bubbly confidence since I was little, like in the neighborhood, they used to say like, Kelsey's going to be the first female president. (laughs) It's like the joke when I was growing up, like, you know, eight, nine years old, like I just, um, was always a very curious kid, you know, asking lots of questions, like wanting to learn and know and be a part of all the adult conversations. I was never afraid to talk to a stranger. Uh, I have very outgoing parents too. So I think I learned a lot of those ways of being from them that, you know, you don't have to be serious all the time. They're fun and funny people. So um, yeah, I think that kind of like helped pave the way for me to know that it's okay to be like this. And the confidence blend with vulnerability that like, you know, has come so full circle into what I do with dope. Um, that has also been so rewarding. Like the more vulnerable you can be, it lets someone else let their guard down and share something that maybe they wouldn't have otherwise. So, you know, when I'm sharing about my recovery journey on a call with a retail buyer who, you know, probably never has these kind of conversations with vendors, he is sharing about how his daughter, you know, just got sober two years ago or, uh, it's, you know, examples from investors who were saying, you know, their daughter or aunt or sister, whoever you name it, you know, is, is struggling. And this kind of, um, this kind of barrier breaking of like, we're all going through it. Like we're all just humans. Yes. We all have these little roles and we're showing up to do these things. And, you know, you're an investor. I'm trying, we're trying to work together to get this money. We're all human. And like, if one in 12 Americans are in active recovery, chances are pretty high that like I'm talking to somebody who either is in recovery or has someone who's struggling too. So that's really helped me to feel even more confident in like owning my story, like owning my decisions, owning who I am and knowing that like, if I'm just myself, I'll attract the right people and, and, you know, have people around me who like who I am. Then there was no like facade or mask to keep up. It's just, uh, it just gets to be me. So what's your, number one sort of thought about motherhood it's right around the corner (laughs) I'm scared shitless (laughs) yeah no it's right around the corner but this last year as we started to get a little bit more stabilized and you know we made it through the pandemic we started to grow the retail channel like things were feeling a little more secure um and this like biological clock just started ticking of saying like you you need to be a mom you've got to do this so um, I'm really excited. It's so fun. It's interesting to see how this little thing, big decision, but little thing can so drastically change how you view what's important in the world. Um, you know, there's just no question of like, we're gonna make this work and figuring out how to, you know, make my workload and what we need to do with dope work so that I can still, you know, care and spend time for and bond with, with our child. So yeah, I'm very excited is all I can say about it. We'll see what happens. It's going to be the wildest adventure yet, but I think I've got some good training with stress levels at dope, you know, overwhelm and running the company with my husband too. It's a, I think it's a lot more than some parents have when they first go into, into parenthood. Um, we've certainly, yeah, been through some challenges together and learned how to communicate well. So I'm excited. It's really, really cool. Congratulations actually on everything. <laughs> Thank you. Um, thank you (laughs) business baby and the real yeah um yeah and sobriety and all the rest of it coming into yourself and like growing up into such an amazing human you've always been an amazing human and like it's just really cool to see how how cool you are um and everything that you're doing to help other people um so thank you kelsey marrera uh ceo and founder of dope legit cookie dough and so much more Um, Dope for Hope. Thanks for joining today on the podcast. Never miss an episode of In Technology by following us here on YouTube or wherever you get your audio podcasts.
The views and opinions expressed are those of the guests and author and do not necessarily reflect the official policy or position of Intel Corporation.